All right, it is 12.11, so I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, get started. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name's Liz reiner Platt. I am the director of the Law, Rights, and Religion Project, or LRRP. And we are a law and policy think tank that advocates for religious liberty, religious pluralism, and social justice. And we're based at the Center for Gender and Sexuality Law here at Columbia Law School, metaphorically here. Um, and I'm so glad to welcome you to this event where um, we are going to be exploring how uh, Native American religious communities both stand to be harmed by the recent uh, expansion of free exercise rights in ways that are increasingly permitting uh, religious foster care agencies in particular, but many others as well, to engage in religiously motivated discrimination, uh, while at the same time, um, Native American communities have also not always benefited from the full and expanding um, free exercise protections, and particularly with the regards to, for example, the protection of sacred religious sites. So the speakers are going to be focusing on an amicus brief that they wrote and filed in last year's Fulton v. Philadelphia case, urging the Supreme Court not to allow state-funded child welfare organizations to engage in religiously motivated discrimination. And I think um, I just wanted to quickly mention that spending some time thinking about this issue and particularly the history of how our child welfare systems have been used as really a tool of religious subjugation is uh, particularly and, and really heartbreakingly apt today, given that just yesterday we heard from Texas Governor Greg Abbott um, that he called on private citizens to begin uh, reporting parents who provide gender affirming care to their trans children to the state for child abuse investigations. Um, so in just a moment, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the, the mic to Alex Vasquez of Columbia's Native American Law Students Association, uh, which is co-hosting this event to introduce our speakers today. Um, we're going to hear an amazing presentation and then followed by some Q&A. So please do feel free to, uh, feel free to drop your questions for our speakers in the Zoom Q&A function down at the bottom, you know, as they come to you and, and we'll um, swing back to those uh, towards the end. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand the mic off to Alex. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you all so much for coming. Um, my name is Alex Vasquez and I'm the president of NALSA. It is my pleasure to be introducing our two speakers today. First, I will introduce Ms. April U.P. Roll. Ms. U.P. Roll is an enrolled member of the Assiniboine and Sioux tribes of the Fort Peck Indian Reservation. She is a litigation associate in the Los Angeles office of Munger, Tolles, and Olson, focusing her practice on complex civil litigation and investigations. Ms. U.P. Roll also maintains an active pro bono practice in American Indian law. She has drafted and filed numerous amicus briefs in the federal appellate courts and the United States Supreme Court. And in addition to her law practice, Ms. U.P. Roll is a frequent speaker and lecturer on Indian law topics. Prior to joining her law firm, Ms. U.P. Roll also clerked for both the U.S. District Court for the District of Montana and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Next, we have Professor Matthew Fletcher. Professor Fletcher is a member of the Grand Traverse Band. He graduated from the University of Michigan Law School in 1997 and the University of Michigan in 1994. He is a foundation professor of law at Michigan State University College of Law and director of the Indigenous Law and Policy Center. In 2021 to 2022, he will be the inaugural visiting professor for the UC Hastings Indigenous Law Program. He sits as the Chief Justice of the Porch Band of Creek Indian Supreme Court and also sits as an appellate judge for several other Indian nations. He is a reporter for the American Law Institute's Restatement of the Law of American Indians. His newest book, Ghost Road, Anishinaabe Responses to Indian Hating, was published by Fulcrum Publishing in 2020, and he has published several law review articles and case books, including the one that my federal Indian law class used. Uh, Professor Fletcher's scholarship has been cited by the United States Supreme Court, and additionally, Professor Fletcher is the primary editor and author of the leading law blog on American Indian law pol policy, Turtle Talk. So with that, I will turn it over to you both, and we can go ahead and get started. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm embarrassed every time somebody reads off that giant bio. Maybe next time I'll just say, I'll give you two sentences and leave it at that. 
Um, Naperville's bio is much more accurate, and probably more accurate for you. So, okay, so uh, you've been at, we've been asked to talk a little bit about um, our work writing and uh, filing an amicus brief in the Fulton case, and uh, I'm going to step back a little bit. A lot of that, a lot of the work behind or the substance behind the amicus brief comes from a law review article that. Uh, my lovely wife and I put together in uh, 2017 in the Nebraska Law Review called Indian Children in the Federal Trust, Federal Tribal Trust Relationship. And the goal of that article was trying to, to buttress the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And so most of the article is really about showing from the very inception of the United States that the federal government had intervened in the lives of Indian children. Uh, and can, from all throughout American history and well into the era of the NHL Welfare Act, the goal there was to show that the founding fathers would have understood that there was federal power to engage in Indian tribes. So that's in the last half century, that's a much better prospect than it was at the beginning of the United States, but that's not really the point of that article. Um, about uh, a good chunk through the article, we started to notice that um, when we got into the boarding school section, uh, the later part of the 19th century, it hit us uh, later on that uh, the separation of powers between church and state, I should just say, the separation between church and state, and, uh, you know, uh, manifested or, or memorialized in the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, had never played any role whatsoever in Indian affairs. So typically what would happen is a, a tribe would enter into a treaty in the United States. The United States would promise through its duty of protection to provide education to Indian children. And the United States would then take uh, federal appropriations, tribal uh, annuity monies, and route that into churches for the purpose of educating Indian children and intentionally uh, missionaries. Um, it actually hit me while we were working on this paper that one of the leading cases, the earliest foundational cases of uh, Supreme Court uh, is from the, one of the Marshall Trilogy, it's called Worcester versus Georgia. We'd love to cite that case for the proposition that state law is no force in Indian country, uh, but that case is about Samuel Worcester, who was in Indian country because he was a, he was a paid federal government employee who was an, a missionary. He was there paid by the federal government to go to Indian country to try to um, uh, convert Indians into Christianity. And that's a, a project that had been going on uh, parallel to all of this other stuff involving Indian children. And uh, when we were asked, and I'll talk more about this later, to draft an amicus brief uh, in the Fulton case, that was sort of the jumping off point for April's work in putting together the brief. And so I'll turn it over to her and talk to talk more specifically about the brief. Um, so the brief really does take uh, a ton from Matthew and Winona's article. I mean, it was just the sort of foundational, um, like guiding text in putting together this brief. Um, in my work at Munger Tolls, as Alex noted, I do uh, have a, a, I frequently uh, draft and file amicus briefs in the federal appellate court. So when this came to me, um, through Matthew and through Professor Kate Fort, who's one of the Indian law professors I represented on the brief, um, it really, I think it really presented an opportunity to sort of put the, all of this history in the record. So we went through and we really just talked about all of this history of um, coercion uh, on the part of the federal government and sort of the federal government's close relationship uh, to religious institutions and the way that Indian children um, and religious conversion of Indian children was used as a tool of assimilation. Um, and, you know, we're talking all the way into, uh, well into the 20th century. So uh, I, from my perspective, it just sort of provided this incredible opportunity to tell that story to the Supreme Court and to really illustrate why, um, you know, although I strongly value uh, the free exercise of religion as all of us do, in the Indian country context. And actually one of the questions in this case suggested that the court overrule Smith, which we can talk about later. And I thought it was kind of strange, honestly, for um, an Indian law person to be on the side of effectively defending Smith. Um, but um, I just thought it was an incredible opportunity to get all of this incredible research that Matthew had done. In addition to um, some of the other sort of detailed writing on ICWA, uh, in front of the court and to use 
that history to really explain why religion and child welfare um, don't mix. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, um, maybe Matthew should talk about how the brief came to us in the first place. I'm happy to do so. So uh, at Michigan State, the uh, Indian Law Clinic, which is run by Kate Ford, uh, works a lot on the Indian Child Welfare stuff. We have a, what we call an ICWA, which is the acronym for the Indian Child Welfare Act, an ICWA Appellate Defense Project. And um, I, it's my sense that Kate Ford is the only person in the country who, on a day-to-day -day basis, is actually working on appellate cases involving the Indian Child Welfare Act. She's sort of the go-to person for anybody who litigates those cases. So we see a lot of that work. Kate also does a lot of advocacy work um, in relation to the, the regulations behind ICWA. And um, she's involved in a, uh, as counsel for the tribal interests, a case that's pending right now, which challenges the federal government's um, failure to collect data from states on foster care placements. And I apologize for not knowing the uh, acronym, what the, what the acronym means, but it's, we call it the AFGARS litigation. And AFGARS are federal rules that fe is the federal obligation to collect data on foster care placements, racial data, sexual orientation data, all sorts of things. Um, the federal government, the states don't want the federal government to know this information or anybody to know this information. And the federal government has been enabling states to not reveal this information for decades. Um, her partners in the uh, in the Afghars litigation are uh, places like Lambda Legal, who uh, advocate for uh, equality and sexual orientation. And so there's uh, there was some symmetry there when the Fulton case came down. I think Lambda Legal and ACLU asked Kate if she would uh, put the Indian Law and Policy Center, at, Indigenous Law and Policy Center at Michigan State, would put together an amicus brief. And so we decided to put together something based on um, of the, the history of the lack of separation or lack of separation of church and state in Indian affairs. Um, and a little bit, and strategically, we've sort of admitted a lot of this out, but um, that, that history is still very prevalent in Indian child welfare cases. In fact, there's a case pending in the Supreme Court right now, I'll talk about later a little bit, that is directly related or indirectly related to um, continuing religious, frankly, persecution of Indian people. And I, you know, I want to sort of back up to make sure that um, we sort of situate ourselves in context. So um, Fulton was a case, uh, Catholic Social Services in Philadelphia refused to provide home studies for same-sex couples. So refused to even consider them um, as placements for kids in need of uh, foster care. Um, so you know, uh, we supported the respondents' argument that religion and child welfare don't mix using this sort of terrible history and the terrible statistics. Um, and really, uh, you know, the thrust of our brief is that religion shouldn't be used to place a, a value judgment on loving and qualified homes and in the, you know, Indian law context to remove children from not only their families, but their culture is sort of a purposeful process of extermination. Um, and there's something sort of really interesting about the way this brief came to us, right? Because uh, I think it illustrates that Indian law doesn't map directly onto sort of um, the American American politics in general. Um, Indian law is full of strange bedfellows and strange alliances. I think that um, you know a lot of folks might think that our uh, that Kate's work with Lambda Legal and ACLU is sort of a natural fit for Indian law issues, but. In other religious freedom cases, for example, a close colleague of mine litigated on behalf of Cheyenne River, their religious freedom claim in the uh, Dakota Access Pipeline litigation. And she has talked to me about how the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, who actually re represented the petitioner in Fulton, really supported the tribe's claims in that case. So uh, this is a really interesting example of how our issues don't tend to map on one-to-one -one with sort of where, uh, the American political context and how we might think of these as sort of left or right um, or, you know, or black and white in other terms. So it was um, a unique opportunity, I think, to, again, you know, uh, to be on the side of a claim, uh, on the side of the parties opposing overruling Smith, which uh, <laughs> 
Smith and Ling, which we'll probably talk about, in my opinion, are two fantastic examples of the court doubting the sincerity of American Indian religious beliefs and religious practices, and really departing from the rest of their uh, jurisprudence in the area when it comes to sort of um, established Western religions, established mainstream religions, and certainly not place-based religions. So um, when Matthew and Kate sent this to me, they sent the uh, cert petitions to me and said, uh, we want to file a brief. And, you know, we, I had been fortunate enough to represent a group of Indian law scholars before in Brett Keen, the case that Matthew will talk about later before the Fifth Circuit on Bonk. Um, so when they came to me and were like, we want to do another one, and this is the case, I was like, I'm not sure I understand what our argument is at first, because I, I really thought that we were going to present some sort of um, Indian law case based on uh, really the terrible sort of outcome in Smith, but that in effect was, you know, it's a sort of multifaceted issue. So it took me a minute to understand what we were doing here. And thankfully I had the roadmap of Matthew's journal article um, to really sort of guide the, the remaining research and the argument in our brief. Um, and I just, you know, I don't want to take us too far astray, but I do also want to plug for the law students uh, who are sort of thinking about next steps in Indian law. Amicus work is such an incredible way to get involved early in your career. Um, so I just want to, you know, briefly plug, like, these opportunities exist, and once you are sort of out in the world, um, you get to represent people that you really look up to. You get to work closely with them to craft arguments that are persuasive and really advance the field. Um, so I just, you know, sort of brief aside that I really want to plug that opportunity for uh, folks who are early in their career. Um, Matthew, do you want to talk a little bit about Brackeen and the sort of ongoing threats? Sure. So, you know, we were also asked to explore the tension between um, for, for tribal interests and individual Indian people in sort of this terrain that, that's developing at the Supreme Court and nationally in relation to the ten, well, really the tension between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause, right? So it's sort of a spectrum. On one hand, you know, the federal government and state governments cannot establish a religion. On the other hand, uh, they can't prevent uh, the free exercise of religion. And the, all of the litigation that I've noticed in my lifetime, um, going back even before Employment Division versus Smith and Lane, was um, uh, a push and pull between the spectrum between those two areas. And we're in a place right now where we're very close, uh, in my view, at the Supreme Court of establishing religion. And uh, Governor Abbott's uh, just outright saying it. There, there is a religion that is the United States religion. It is Christianity. Um, it is rooted in um, white supremacy, let's be frank. So but I, I'm maybe jumping ahead a little bit here. April wanted me to talk about Brackeen. So here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I said that, uh, that Indian people are already be, are continually uh, being subjected to religious persecution. Um, and tangentially, uh, those issues are very present in the Indian Child Welfare Act litigation now, pres now in the Supreme Court. They haven't granted cert yet, but we fully expect them to do uh, on that question. So uh, I'm going to send a, send a link, a link on here to uh, season two of This Land, which is a podcast uh, that is the background of the Brackeen case. Um, I'm, I'm in there a, bit, a little bit here, but the, the parts that I'm not in are where I learned a lot. Uh, the Brackeen case is about uh, the state of Texas is challenging the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. They were joined by three non-Indian uh, adoptive, or excuse me, foster parents who had um, Indian children as foster children. They wanted to adopt those children. The Brackeens and um, the Cliffords, which is another of the foster families, uh, chose to adopt children because of their religious uh, beliefs. They already had their own kids in some instances. Some of these foster parents already had their own kids, but their, their evangelical Christian uh, beliefs compelled them to adopt other children. And the way that they chose to do that was through the foster care system. And uh, so they became foster parents. And one of the, the couples, there were three at issue here, one of them actually uh, chose a, an Indi Indian children on purpose because of their um, 
their, their beliefs that Indian people should be subjected to Christianity, should be converted to Christianity. Um, now, now, this is not viable under the Indian Child Welfare Act, but it is actually things, it is something that happens all the time. Um, the, the overall challenge to the Indian Child Welfare Act is a uh, very big, well-funded, many groups are bringing work, uh, challenges, primarily from the private adoption uh, market and uh, right-wing organizations like the, um, most notably the Goldwater Institute, designed to try to strike down the Indian Child Welfare Act. The private adoption market, many of those adoption agencies, as in Fulton, are religiously oriented. They discriminate often. Not all of these religious organizations do in this way, but they discriminate in ways that are very illiberal on the basis of race and ancestry, certainly sexual orientation. That's the, the, that's the groups arrayed against the Indian Child Welfare Act. That's the groups that we're, we're fighting back against to try to, to stop all of this. Um, it is a, a, a deep concern that, um, that these groups are coming after Indian children in particular. Um, and we have actually an example of that in our act, in the case that's pending in the Supreme Court now, Becky. Um, I want to contrast that with other cases. So keep in mind, when we're defending Brackeen, we're trying to keep religion out of this area. But I also want to mention that the history of the Indian Child Welfare Act is very much rooted in religious persecution. So the Indian Child Welfare Act itself was passed by Congress in 1978. And for decades before 1978, states and private religious organizations were illegally removing children from their Indian homes and placing them intentionally with non-Indian families as far from the reservation as possible. Um, the paper that uh, single, my wife Single, no, 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 Single and I wrote opens with her story. Uh, when she was four, she had a two-year-old sister who was taken during church by a, a, a church for a church people and paraded in front of white people at a different church and as a, a piece of meat to be adopted. And uh, that's how she lost her sister. Um, this is this is sort of the history uh, leading up to the Indian Child Welfare. It was overt religious discrimination. State social workers, courts, and law enforcement worked hand in hand with religious organizations to remove children uh, for the purposes of assimilation and civilization, which is a long-standing problem in Indian country, um, and placing them with uh, evangelical Christian families often, um, including Catholic, Mormon, uh, Protestants, every kind of uh, Christian-based uh, religion you can think of. Now, a lot of that sort of went underground after the enactment of the Indian Child Welfare Act. There were still these overtly uh, religious-based organizations that tried to uh, enable uh, adoptions by their constituents, their their patronage, basically their um, you know their believers, um, targeting. Uh, an adoption market that, uh, starting in the 1970s, began to shrink dramatically. Um, if you're an evangelical Christian who wants to adopt somebody, a child, for the purpose of basically converting them to your religion, um, you're you're going to be looking for uh, people of color from different entity from different uh, communities. You're going to be looking for poor people, often again people of color, uh, that you want to save, that you want to uh, evangelicized. So um, that's all still present uh, in, in the private adoption market. and um, But a lot of it kind of went underground. People don't overtly say this anymore. Um, thanks to social media, they often say it a lot. Evangelicals can't stop talking. Uh, that's the whole point of being an evangelical. And so they're, uh, this is what but why I put the link to this land with a few episodes in there where there are actual quotations from a blog, post, and Twitter feed from the party in the Bracken case talking about why they're doing this and why they are compelled by their religious beliefs to search out um, non -believe, non -believe, the children of non-believers for this purpose. Now, there's also an additional tension that April sort of implied, and I'm going to send you a link to a case pending in the Ninth Circuit right now, which is where the federal government um, 
is intentionally targeting Indian religions for the purpose of uh, really destroying them in some respects. So this case that I'm pointing you to is called Apache Stronghold versus United States. And it's about a sacred site that once was on federal public lands, a sacred site of the uh, San Carlos Apache tribe. And, uh, and one of the last acts that Senator John McCain did in Arizona was a sweetheart deal for a mining company. He turned over this sacred site to a mining company and a rider to an act of Congress for the purpose of mining. And the, everybody agrees that the mine will destroy this uh, incredible heritage, this incredible location of the San Carlos Apache Nation. And um, the, the religion will, will, will cease to exist. And that's all on, on purpose. Um, I, I don't know that the federal government thinks, well, let's destroy this religion by giving this mining company a chance to destroy it. It's a, frankly, a financial giveaway. The mining company, um, probably doesn't care either about the religion, but it is an act of the federal government that uh, will lead to, uh, in all, of all respects, the destruction of this religion, which is the, the, the Ling case from 1988. Um, the, the tension here, of course, is that this time the tribe is robustly trying to assert its religious exercise rights. Um, and, you know, it's trying to say, you know, we love employment division versus Smith, uh, you know, we want the federal government's actions to be held to a strict scrutiny uh, 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 rationale. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, ironically, I suppose, the other, the other, on the other side, with Indian child welfare, it's the opposite, right? They, you know, the, the tribes are worried that, um, I mean, these, the, the, the religious uh, practitioners are trying to say we have a free exercise right. Um, to, to adopt Indian children and, and other kinds of children. So tribes have, are forced nationally to walk a very um, a very thin line. And I, the last thing I'm gonna say, and I've been talking a lot, I wanna remind everybody that after Employment Division versus Smith came down in 1990, uh, Congress very quickly attempted to reverse that decision with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Now, my, it's my understanding, this is before my time, I had just started in college around that time, but it's my understanding that um, after Employment Division versus Smith came down, which was a case about the Native American church, all of the large uh, lobbying entities, powerful religious groups came together, uh, united in every respect to go to Congress and force a reversal. And they were very successful. But a key function of uh, a key strategy of, the, of, those, of that uh, wall of religious expression was to exclude American Indians from that uh, advocacy effort. Uh, the thinking was, uh, if you go to Congress with Judeo-Christian religions, um, and then you add in American Indians, they won't pass the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That was sort of the, the state of play in 1990, 1991. I think it's still the state of play. There's no doubt in my mind, the tribe is going to lose uh, and the individual Indian religious practitioners are going to lose in the Apache Stronghold case because, as April said, um, they don't have a roof on their church. And, um, you know, you know who does? It's the adoptive, uh, the foster parents in Rakhine. And you will see directly uh, the, the, the hypocrisy of what, what's going to be happening in religious freedom and exercise, uh, excuse me, establishment cases going forward for a long time. And I just want to add, I, I should learn, and someday I will learn, not to be like the hopeful note to Matthew's far more realistic take on these issues. But, um, you know, I do think that there is some reason to believe um, that there is some hope for American Indian religious freedom claims going forward. I mean, when Justice Gorsuch was on the Tenth Circuit and wrote the Hobby Lobby decision, or concurred in the Hobby Lobby decision, he um, talked about how the sincerity of belief is all that matters. And if we only protect sort of the dominant religions in this country, then we've failed uh, in our effort to protect the free exercise of religion and to sort of live up to that sort of ideal religious pluralistic society that he uh, understands our founding to have intended us to be. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm not incredibly hopeful, but I do think that there's reason to believe that as the law evolves in this way, and particularly combined with Justice Gorsuch's attention to Indian law issues, perhaps there's some hope that 
Um, maybe we'll just lose less fat. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, someday, I, though, I will learn not to follow Matthew's realism with us, but maybe, but today is not that day. You know, what, what I learned in law school, and uh, I still think is very much a very serious theory of politics and law, is what is uh, Derek, Bell, Derek Bell called interest convergence. And, um, you know, I've always... Uh, looked for places where tribal interests can converge with the interests of sort of mainstream uh, power players and law and, and law and culture and politics. And um, I, I see that happening in the, uh, the Apache case, the uh, uh, sacred sites case, in a way that actually kind of terrifies me. The, the entities that are joining up uh, to, to side with the tribes now in a way that they would not have done in 1991 um, are also advocating for the right to use their uh, religious freedom to discriminate against people on the basis of sexual orientation and gender um, and certainly race. And so the case that the Supreme Court granted the other day, uh, which we were terrified you guys would ask us about, but I took a look at it and it fits the bill, I think it's called 303 something, um, is basically a religious uh, freedom exercise uh, excuse to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. Um, you know, the, I don't know many, many tribes, if any at all, they're gonna join in on a, on a position like that. But they might write an amicus brief saying, if you're going to allow the uh, authority uh, or you're going to allow for governments to discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation, then why won't you protect our sacred sites? And uh, so there, there's interest convergence there that um, is a little bit terrifying to me. But I, I'm i trying to, when I say that, I'm, when, when April says I'm being negative, I'm trying to carve out sort of a good thing, which is we don't really want to be on their side in a lot of these cases. I think I said being realistic, not being negative, to be clear. Oh. <laughs> All good. I don't know if we want to turn it over to questions. I don't, Matthew, I don't know if you. Great idea. Uh, why don't you, uh, uh, our lovely hosts can, uh, our brilliant hosts can um, uh, moderate for us. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, that was really rich and I just have like 10 sticky notes around me. So I'll, I'll try to be coherent. But um, I, I think we kind of, um, talked around this, but I, I, I want to kind of pose it directly, and it, it is a big question. So, it, you know, if you were on the Supreme Court, let's say, what do we do about Ling? Um, again, it's a decision that says, uh, you know, a, even if a government action completely destroys uh, a, a religion, um, it does not constitute a substantial burden because we're not asking the individual practitioners to do anything. We're destroying their sacred site, but they're not told they can't go there. They're not told this or that. So it's, this is just the government's own action. It's not a, uh, it's their decision to build the road or to create the mine or whatever. Um, it's not a substantial burden. So on the one hand, um, that's the horrific way to, to look at religious liberty. On the other hand, do we want religions to have the ability to influence or direct government functions? And I'm thinking things like education. Um, you know, who knows? I think the possibilities are endless. So, so how would you thread that needle? And what do we do about Ling? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, I want to reiterate something that April said about Ling earlier, which is, uh, if you read between the lines in those cases, it's really apparent that you have a court that does not believe the, uh, the religious practice, practice of the Indian people in that case. They were really doubting all of that. Um, and they were so confident, I believe, in Ling in particular, that this religious practice was completely bogus, that they said, we'll just assume for purposes of argument that it will be destroyed. Um, Justice O'Connor was willing to do that because she was so sure that all of this religious exercise was complete and utter bullshit. Um, obviously it's not. So uh, there's also another thread to the Ling case in particular uh, that is uh, related to the Supreme Court's 
concern back in those days that some justices may still share that this was just an effort by a bunch of Indians to get their land back in a way that um, they couldn't do through other legal means, right? So uh, Justice O'Connor and Ling reiterates again and again, again, this is the federal government's property. You know, the federal government is a property owner in this case, uh, but you're absolutely right in characterizing Ling as um, really just, uh, uh, you know, not very persuasive in the notion that there's no substantial burden, right? Uh, and just sort of splitting hairs and saying, well, we're not actually affirmatively making you do anything. We're just, you know, you're just, just your religion's going to be destroyed passive aggressively. So that's okay. Um, how do we deal with, with that now? Should we try to get rid of Ling? Um, I totally think Ling was wrongly decided then and now and should be reversed. Um, I've, I've been pretty skeptical about what religious freedom practitioners uh, are, are or why they're helping tribes. But I think tribes can actually use the po that power as well for, for considerable good. Um, what was Ling about? Ling was about uh, you know, environmental protection. They were, they were gonna cut trees down. They were gonna deforest a whole area. The only reason it hadn't been deforested, of redwood trees, by the way, was because there was no way to get there. The road in Ling was the reason to get there. Well, think also about the um, San Francisco Peaks case that went up in flames in the Ninth Circuit, where a, a whole consortium of tribes and Indian people came together to challenge the the uh, the, the Arizona Snowball Ski Resort uh, on near Flagstaff, Arizona. And um, you know why were the tribes doing that? Yes, there was a religious freedom thing, but fundamentally that case was about the fact that the Southwest is in a drought. And this ski resort had no more snow and it came up with this utterly ridiculous idea to take gray water and dump it all over this uh a mountain so that they could continue to have uh privileged people keep skiing there and um, that's the case really in many respects is a tribe's exercise of uh, protection of religious freedom protection of its religion but also often those religions are tied to um, environmental protection so uh, I always say, if you would give, ask me to give a talk about how tribes can use treaty rights or other rights um, to fight climate change, uh, I would, I'm all, always there saying tribes are here for all of us. We're, we're going to save you. And we can actually use religious freedom and religious exercises in means of doing that to some extent. I also think, I mean, if you look at this, I think the Snowball case is a great one to bring up because the Supreme Court there or I'm sorry, the Ninth Circuit there talked about how the use of the gray water to create snow on the mountain was at best a subjective, an impact on the subjective uh, experience of religion, which, I mean, I don't know what religion is, if not in, inherently subjective and different for each person. And there's a dissent in that case by Judge Fletcher, no relation, um, that uh, talks about how the, the court really gets it wrong there and shows that uh, all of these sort of cases that concern these, you know, sacred places that are closely tied to these environmental issues, um, what they're really doing is doubting the sincerity of belief, doubting whether this is a real religion. So, I mean, I think for my part, I think Ling has to go because I don't know how you get to the protection of place-based religion when Ling is still on the books, um, because the location of the place matters so much in that decision. Um, I appreciate that it is sort of a fraught context, especially when we're talking about, you know, the federal government's ability to act free from, um, you know, all of these sort of religious concerns. But I think if they're ever, and, and I mean, keep in mind, Matthew's talking about the, the circumstances surrounding RIFRA. I mean, all RIFRA does is restore the uh, pre-Smith, pre-employment division versus Smith status quo, and Ling is pre-Smith. So like that, that sort of singling out of place-based religions, I think really is like intimately tied to Ling. And in my opinion, it's got to go if we are ever going to actually have uh, Native religious practices respected in the court. We have a lot of questions. Yeah, we do. Um, I'm going to try to there. We have two, in, uh, two um, questions related to interest convergence theory um, that I'm going to try to kind of combine. Um, so, uh, Professor Michael McNally, um, you know, uh, said that the, talked about the Beckett Fund, 
um, said they've represented a group of re religious practitioners who for religious freedom purposes were challenging the federal Eagle Feather access accommodations um, that are key to tribal citizenship and asked if they, yeah, you had more to say about how native people should engage or not with such convergent interests. Um, and bear with me, I think there, were, there was another similar question about, you know, how skeptical should we be about these interests, these points of convergence? And is there a way to maybe exploit isn't the perfect word, but, but um, benefit from them while also maintaining a, like a clear differentiation? Well, I, you know, I, 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 I am worried about that. I don't know how to make that distinction. So, you know, uh, I would be up for um, some sort of reasonable rule on, say, the Eagle Acts. Um, it, the federal government ties it directly to tribal membership in a federally recognized tribe. You know, there's a couple hundred thousand people out there probably who truly are Indians who, for whatever reason, are not eligible somewhere for tribal membership um, for reasons of historical uh, ridiculousness and probably should be eligible. And the constitution itself uses the words Indians and Indian tribes. So um, there's no doubt in my mind, you can still be considered an Indian under the constitution and uh, not be a member of a federally recognized tribe. That's an arbitrary distinction. Now, if you win that case, what, what happens then? Um, well, you've established in Indian law, a sort of a, a particular kind of uh, extension of, of law that it's ar that's already really on the books and that's justifiable. Uh, what if you are a, a, a religious uh, uh, organization that wanted to use that as a jumping off point to something else that perhaps tribal interests would object to or individual Indian people for whatever reason? Um, I, you know, I firmly believe the slippery slope is a logical fallacy, but um, you know it's it's possible that you know that on the backs of Indian people, uh, you know a a, a, a disturbing uh, religious organization could expand those arguments into other areas. Um, I don't think they need to use Indian people or tribes uh, for that purpose. I mean, there's already a case pending in Supreme Court that is going to start chipping away at that. Um, so I, I, that to me, it's, it, it's, I'm skeptical, but, uh, I'm worried, but I don't think it's the end of the world. At least it's, if it's going to be the end of the world, it's not going to be our fault. So maybe, let me just put it back. Um, so we have a, another question from, um, an anonymous attendee who, that I think is, you know, a lot of people might be thinking about, which is, um, can you speak about the implications of indigenous people having to navigate a quote, Western concept of religion and legal proceedings? So talk a little bit about the very kind of definition of religion. You know, I don't know if this will answer that question, but I've had some thoughts uh, about what the Supreme Court might do in, with, with a straight up uh, native religion case, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the Supreme Court. Um, and it's been a while since they had, they've had a case like that. Um, you know, employment division was 1990. There was a case called uh, about well, ayahuasca uh, with the acronym UDB, which is about 15 years ago now. Um, here's what I, I wonder, and it might not be that it doesn't, it, this doesn't come up because of a native religion, but um, what, what, who are, who's on the Supreme Court right now? They're, they're textualists. And they're uh, obsessed with the original public understanding of the Constitution. So, what, what, what would they would they would ask the question, what would George or J James Madison and George Washington say about Native religions? And they would say, well, it's, it's conceivable that a majority of the Supreme Court would say, when we look at religious freedom, we're looking at the religious freedom of white men. We've got the votes to say that. That's what the framer, the original public understanding was about. Um, and that's just what we're going to do. And I think the pushback on that, of course, perhaps is Judaism, because, you know, I don't know that the founding fathers were big fans of, of Jewish people back in those days. I do know they were not fans of Indians. So I think that that's, that's actually a concern I have. 
if we were really going to obsess about what the, the methodology of the Supreme Court does not bode well for Indian people in this regard. It bodes well in other ways, interestingly enough. We were just talking about the con powers of Congress or something, or tribal sovereignty. Not so much Indian religion. Oh, your mention of Judaism makes me think of um, George Washington's famous letter to a Jewish congregation, and I think it was Rhode Island talking about, you know, extolling the virtues of religious freedom in, in, in America at the same time that he was, of course, you know, a slaveholder and hard to mesh that with religious liberty. Um, uh, April, I'll give you an opportunity to add some optimism if you care to before <laughs> moving on to the next question. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure that I have optimism to add here, but what I do think is really interesting, which is sort of an inherent tension here, is the idea, there's another question also about, like, should we require other uh, religions, should we hold them to a higher sincerity standard, and, you know, I keep coming to this uh, point about doubting sincerity, and I think this is related to Native people uh, n navigating a Western concept of religion uh, at the Supreme Court and elsewhere, which is that, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, issues with like proving your sincerely held uh, religious belief that's place based. Like I don't know, identifying where those sacred places are, explaining why they're sacred, uh, talking about them at certain times of the year, sharing that publicly. Like I I think that there's an inherent tension here, and I actually do not. I mean, I I just my sort of thought on the sincerity piece of this is that we should just hold the court to what it claims to do, which is to treat that inquiry with kid gloves. And they certainly do that for a number of other um, sort of more widely held religious beliefs. I just wish they would treat Indian religions the same. Um, and also, you know, take sort of a culturally sensitive approach to understanding, like, that there are certain, th I, that there are certain things that Native communities can't share with you um, in sort of making their case for like why this is a sacred place to them um, and why a certain action imprint is on their religious practices. Um, we had a question about the shadow docket and the way the shadow docket of late has been um, used to kind of upend uh, quietly, I would say upend religion law um, and, and the implications that has uh, for Native American religion. And I'll kind of add on to that uh, question, you know, the court appears to have laid down a fairly dramatic new standard in these shadow docket COVID cases, saying that as soon as there is an exception from a law for any sort of secular reason, then we have to have one for religion as well. So if the grocery stores remain open during COVID, then the churches have to remain open too. And so if you could just speak to the, the, those shadow docket opinions and whether that kind of new regime laid down under the COVID cases, um, uh, might be of any kind of help. I, I already typed a little bit of an answer to that to uh, Tori Dolan, who is somebody I met recently. It was uh, just an awesome uh, up and coming scholar in Indian country. Um, it, in addition to what I put in the answer, you know, the thing about the shadow docket is, um, is that it pushes back on le the legitimacy of the Supreme Court to do things. And right now they're getting a lot of heat because uh, they're jumping in, you know, Alabama's redistricting plan, they're jumping in for overtly political things, uh, abortion, vote, uh, like I said, voting rights, and the COVID stuff, the COVID cases. And that, that definitely is going to put, is harming the court. And I think they're starting to realize that. But in something like Indian law, you know, where, you know, the, the, the sort of the, uh, the gatekeepers of public opinion on the Supreme Court, i.e. the legitimacy of the Supreme Court, do not care about Indian people or Indian tribes. And, you know, the, the last Indian Child Welfare Act case, uh, when it came down in 2013, was a remand to the state court. And one of the things the state court said was, uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to give the uh, Indian child back uh, from their Indian parent back to the white family until after a best interest of the child determination. And uh, it was possible, even after losing that case, that the Indian child would have stayed with his biological dad. And the Supreme Court in the shadow docket blocked that order, blocked that hearing, and ended the case, effectively ended the case. Uh, nobody gave a shit at that time because it was Indians. And uh, the shadow docket is a huge threat to 
uh, discrete minorities like and communities like Indian people and Indian tribes. Um, I think at, I think the thing to really really watch for in the future in an in Indian religious freedom case would be a really good example. Is um, maybe the Supreme Court says, look, we we went too far with shadow docket. Justice Kavanaugh has been defending it, part, you know, outrageously. But maybe they're going to back off a little bit. But I don't think they will. They know how incredibly useful it is to get the work done to fulfill their political commitments without having to take any of the heat um, in areas like uh, probably environmental stuff, uh, in native religious freedom, or other other discrete minority questions. And uh, it's a huge tool for oppression of people, frankly. So um, I'm going to take moderator's choice and ask a question myself. Um, going back to um, the the case that the court just granted, 303 v. Alanis, um, uh, revolving around um, free speech and whether a evangelical Christian uh, com a company owned by an evangelical Christian woman is able to basically put out a no same sex couples allowed rule for her wedding website case. Um, you know, this, this, your brief is focused very much on the, uh, on foster care agencies. And I was wondering um, if you could speak a little bit to the kind of larger landscape as we increasingly see not just nonprofit foster care agencies, but all sorts of for profits, hospitals um uh, for-profit entities like Hobby Lobby as this kind of right to pick and choose your customers expands um uh how is that going to impact um uh, Native American communities um beyond the foster care issue well I think that uh I, I don't know actually how I, let me think about that for a second but I think the first this is part of a bigger pro program that is not about Indian people it's about um partly about school of choice. I mean, there, uh, and, and the, the, this is another step toward a longstanding project, which is to um, allow uh, people of religious, re religious and evangelicals to take public money uh, and carve out their own segregated schooling, uh, where they can teach religion, where they can teach that uh, slavery was voluntary, or they can teach that Indian people and Indian tribes don't exist anymore or have no validity. Um, I, that's a much bigger macro problem than uh, with Indians. And how a case like this that goes uh, the way I, we all think, we all know it will, um, how it will affect Indian child welfare is, let's say you are uh, the evangelical Christian foster family who is uh, fostering Indian children with an eye toward adopting them eventually. And the Indian Child Welfare Act uh, has placement preferences that uh, disfavor families like that in favor of, say, a Native person, um, a tribal member, or even a relative. Uh, if you have enough religious freedom in you, you can fight ICWA and say, well, ICWA is discriminating against my preference, my goal as an evangelical Christian to adopt as many Indian children as I possibly can. And if ICWA is in the way, it violates my free exercise. And free exercise uber alis. Um, and so ICWA goes down that way. That's a very extreme, dark view of what could happen. Um, but at, it's it's totally on the table, given what the, 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 the this Supreme Court is doing with religious freedom. Thank you. I also think, I mean, the, the sort of place we find ourselves now um, between a rock and a hard place, I mean, this that has sort of been the theme of this entire discussion. And there's a reason for that, right? Our population is relatively small. Our uh, religious practices are not that understood. And I think that, you know, development of future rules will continue that trend. We will continue to be forced, like, increasingly into a corner by these rules that um, often are made or deliberately privilege uh, more mainstream religion. Um, so I think we have, um, oh, sorry. Okay, I just was checking with Alex if she wanted to ask the last question. Um, so I think we have time for one more. And I, uh, we, Caitlin Brandt asked, um, 
about the dangers of environmentalists also using Native communities for their gains in regards to religious issues. So we're already talking about a lot of like rocks and hard places, and um, this is kind of another one of uh, uh, you know, to what extent is, um, you, said, you mentioned that religious groups may be using Native communities for their own agenda and thinking on that line, I'm reminding you, I'm reminded of tensions at Standing Rock about religious issues or environmental issues. So if anyone would like to speak to that question. I think I would defer to April on this one. Oh, great, okay. Um, you know, I really, I think that we should always be skeptical of our allies. Tribal sovereignty is a, um, it's not a popular issue really for anyone, right? It's, Tribes do things that environmental groups don't like all the time. Tribes do things that other religious groups don't like all the time. Um, and tribes have the authority to do that because of our retained inherent sovereignty. And so I think that allies are very useful. And I uh, certainly in my work welcome them um, when those sorts of interests are aligned. But I, we also need to be conscious in all cases, whether it's uh, religious liberty groups or environmental groups or any other group that is sort of operating within this increasingly um, aggressive sort of American political split, that we are extra constitutional entities. You know, we are outside of that framework. Our priorities don't often align with one or the other cleanly. Um, and fundamentally, those allies, when they're bringing uh, Indian people in, certainly when they're bringing Indian people in, after their own priorities are set, they are advancing their own agendas and they're free to do so. But we, um, I think we always need to be cautious of like whose priorities come first and like what a sort of tribal voice or a tribal brief or a tribal argument is being used to advance. And really, I think, you know, tribes and Indian lawyers, um, everyone working in this field needs to be conscious of like, what is the end goal here and who does it serve? And is it sort of, the backs of tribes being used to elevate someone else's goal, but the second the tribes do something unpopular, um, you know, tensions will arise and tribes will sort of be left holding the bag. I think that's happened before. Um, so I, you know, I think we just need to be careful. We need to, and we need to avoid uh, letting ourselves be pigeonholed by sort of the very powerful American political dynamic at play. We need to remember that sort of this measured separatism and like the value in our differences that sort of makes us special that, you know, our inherent sovereignty really um, takes us out of this context in a lot of ways. And that means that a lot of these issues, while they may overlap, are not directly our issues. I think that's a really uh, great note to end on. Um, you know, our organization certainly does a lot of work all about the intersection of politics and faith. And one thing I am reminded of often, so my husband's an immigration lawyer. He talks all the time about how he works for a world where his job no longer exists. And I'm increasingly thinking of, I am working for a world where we no longer need litigation um, to solve our religious differences and, and allow flourishing of, of all faiths. So um, I think that's a really powerful note to end on. Um, thank you both so much for your work and for your time today. Uh, we will send out um, a, a video of uh, the event and um, the, some of the links that you shared with us today. Uh, and thank you so much. Take care.